Welcome to the Mikko Kempe podcast. This is a very special episode in English with special guest Dr. John Gray. They say they are relationship experts and then, well, Dr. John Gray, the author of Men of Mars, Women of Venus. And you may or may not know that I actually work for Dr. Gray in his wellness and relationship retreat center in northern part of California. And for the first time, I get to share also the kind of synchronistic story of how all that became about also to him. And for those of you who don't know who Dr. Gray is, well, he is the author of over 20 books. His most well-known book, Men of Mars, Women of Venus, it said that U.S. Today has listed it as top 10 most influential books in the last quarter century, I believe in the United States. It's been translated to 45 different languages approximately. It's been available in 100 different countries. Dr. Gray has been featured in most, if not all, mainstream media, different talk shows, Oprah show, for example. And in this episode, I get to ask him a little bit about questions I don't always hear him expand upon so much. For example, I started with the idea of and question, how one can somebody find their soulmate or perhaps their way in life or purpose in life? And from there, we went on to discuss his latest ideas in his book, Beyond Mars and Venus, and discussed some of the relationship ideas in that book. And then from there, we expanded on topics like gender neutrality, especially here in Finland. It's quite a hot topic. And we discussed about homosexuality, polyamory. And then from there, neuroplasticity. Is it possible to change the brain? Uh, and finally, even about transhumanism. So with that said, please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Dr. John Gray. Kempe podcast, John. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you. <laughs> First of all, uh, I'm really sorry for your for your loss. I still uh, clearly remember one beautiful experience. I remember when uh, Bonnie's, one experience of Bonnie's kindness. I was on one of your wellness retreats and uh, it was New Year and I got a high fever. And I remember how she brought all kind of vitamin and tea drinks for me at the bed. And it was just a beautiful memory I have with her. And uh, just wanted to say that. and. And I know you talk about a lot about synchronicity in, in some of your books. And I wanted to give you a little, little story of how I ended up to your retreats. And then I lead it into a question. Uh, <clears throat> as, as you know, I'm, I've been a, for a long time a big admirer of your work. And uh, when uh, I was 19, I flew from Finland to U.S. And I found one of your books, Together Forever. And read it, of course, changed my life completely. And I was literally flying to a new world to play basketball in the U.S. And then I, I got super interested. It was the first book that really opened my eye, uh, eyes and mind and started reading a lot about self-help, personal development, relationships. And then uh, really devoured all of your books, read some of them many times and uh, listened to all your tapes and VHS tapes and et cetera. And then at some point, I really felt that I kind of knew your philosophy. And I really felt that uh, I, I wanted to somehow meet you and find you. And in the book, one of the favorite book of yours, the How to Get What You Want, What You Have, that I read, I, uh, I actually did a lot of those exercises, those meditation exercises you have, how to find your way. And I was really meditating and trying to find in my mind like some kind of sign some kind of sign for how I could find my way. And then I started Googling how I could find you. And I actually realized that there, that you are having these wellness retreats in Fort Bragg. And this is something you don't know, but my gr grandfather's grandfather's father from Finland, long time ago, and uh, came to the United States. And there's a street named after my <clears throat> grandfather's grandfather's father. And the sign says, Kempes Way, and it's after my uh, grandfather's last name, and that's how I kind of knew. Okay, this can't be just like uh, happenstance, or <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's that kind of made me determined. Okay, yeah, this is this is meant to be, and I ended up coming to uh, to your retreats, which I enjoyed, of course, very much. And this is this is a question I think that's applicable for today. I think we are bombarded by so much information from TVs, media, we are an information overload. And uh, before <clears throat> I ask the question, I preface it by saying that I kind of know your short answer to this, 
which is the question is how to find your own way in life and perhaps for some how to find their soulmate and so forth. And I wanted to ask that from you, but I know the third answer is, answer is which you talk about a lot of books is that, that you should listen to your heart and listen to your feelings. But at the same time, there's, for example, major media, newspapers, even in Finland saying that trusting your feelings is not right, it's wrong. And you also talk about the idea that sometimes we believe in lies and sometimes it's then harder to find your way and perhaps your own truth. So what would be your answer how somebody, somebody can get started with finding your way and perhaps finding a soulmate? Well, you have all my answers there, <laughs> but I'll, <clears throat> I'll rephrase it. <clears throat> Following your heart doesn't mean follow your feelings. Mm. Okay, so what the publicity is saying is correct. So many people follow their feelings and their feelings are wrong. If your feelings are not positive and optimistic and compassionate and grounded, there's a feeling of groundedness which is peaceful and heartfelt. Those are the feelings you should follow. Mainly speaking, most of your positive feelings will lead you in the right direction. But the ones that are really excited, excited, really excited, you gotta let them calm down before you actually believe them. Now, any negative feelings that, uh, any feelings that are causing you to feel stressed should not be believed, okay? If you feel stressed, your brain is not able to access your higher intuition. And that's when we say we're following our heart, we're accessing our higher intuition. Now, what would that mean? Well, biologically, it means that if you're producing stress hormones and you're a man, your female hormones are surging, so you have strong feelings, and your male hormones are going down, which, give, which means you're not detached. See, what we need is to be in touch with our feelings and grounded with a sense of detachment. Uh, this is the male and female sides of us. And if you're a woman and you're stressed, then your testosterone levels are being produced and your female hormones like estrogen and progesterone are not being produced enough. So every person has their own unique balance of male and female hormones. And when they go into balance, stress hormones are gone. When stress hormones are gone, then actually literally blood can flow to the front part of the brain where we can access our pineal gland, which is going to access our ability, our intuition. So even though it's the pineal gland and the brain being activated, it's our heart feels open. Uh, and that's a feeling you have in your heart uh, of uh, happiness and joy and confidence, reassurance and peace. And when your feelings are positive but really excited, often they're overestimating. And when your feelings are negative, they're misinterpreting completely. So that's one aspect of following your heart. So one of the best ways to connect with your heart and to fully feel is the feelings that are, for most people that we know are wrong, <laughs> are the ones where you feel I feel hurt by you. I feel like you don't love me. I feel like I'll never be a success. I'll feel like I can't make my dreams come true. I feel like I'm a bad person. I feel like I'm not good enough. All, all of those. Now you might not be good enough to win the Olympic race, okay? But you know, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just feelings in life in general. So whenever you're stressed, that's a clear sign that you're out of balance. And so at those times, if we're looking at my book, How to Get What You Want, Want What You Have, which you're kind of referring to here, that's the best time to look at, okay, what emotions am I feeling? And the emotions, the negative emotions will always lead you back to an open heart. Now, let me just say that again. Negative emotions, if you follow them by letting them go and letting them go and letting them go, then you're left with an open heart. Uh, it's a little harder with positive emotions to let them go. They just feel so good. That's called an addiction. <laughs> so that's where you have to recognize when I follow certain feelings and do something and afterwards it doesn't feel good. Uh, you know, if there's an up and then it followed by a big down, then I shouldn't go for the big up. So those are clearly identified as addictions. And so if you have addictions, then you basically 
if you give up your addiction, you have to acknowledge the addiction is there. Stopping an addiction will force you to then feel what it's covering up. You see, every addiction is covering up negative emotions. Negative emotions is basically our doorway to salvation, so to speak, because it's, it points the direction of where we're going wrong. You can't go right unless you know you're going left. <laughs> you can't align yourself with the cosmic forces of the universe unless you recognize how you're out of alignment and you come back into alignment. So you could just, that's why we have pain in our body. A pain in our body tells us something's wrong and something has to heal. Emotions, negative emotions is actually emotional pain telling us where we're out of balance. And it's only when you know you're out of balance can you come back into balance. Now, what people don't know is how do you come back into balance? So let's look at a major obstacle to coming back into balance. Let's say, let me use women for example, because their biology is such that even under little stress, they have more emotions than men. Under big stress, men have more emotions than women. So I'm not saying that women are more emotional than men. Actually, men are more emotional if, the, if a man feels insecure. Whereas women uh, feel more emotional even if she feels secure. If it's a little problem, women will have stronger emotions, negative emotions. And if it's a big problem, women stop feeling altogether. They just disconnect. So if we look at our negative emotions, we recognize that if we have an addiction, we feel good to, do our, to eat my sugar or eat, drink alcohol, whatever. If it's too much, how do you know it's too much? It makes you not feel so good later. So you followed your feelings. I feel like <laughs> drinking more, <laughs> but it was wrong. And then you have negative feelings. And what does it mean to follow your negative feelings? It means to use them to produce a result. So, and I said that we look at women, for example, because women often use their negative feelings to get more in their relationships. And then it, at bigger upsets, men use their negative emotions. So it's not like one's more emotional than the other, we're just different. And this is biologically true. Uh, I read it in a science journal, which is that under moderate stress, women have eight times more of an emotional reaction, blood flow to the emotional part of the brain. Whereas under a big stress, uh, men have more emotion than women. So let's, I don't want to you know, sound like just women are more emotional because men can be more emotional as well. And you better walk out of the room when men get emotional. Uh, if women are emotional, if you learn how to just not interfere with the process, but actually take some time to listen and understand, listening to a woman's emotions and negative emotions without getting angry back, which is a, a talent, you have to learn how to do that. Um, her estrogen levels will start to rise and her stress levels will go down. So men and women are different. Uh, so now when we talk about using negative emotions, this is really bad news. Because uh, what I see is uh, one of the major addictions that women have is that they use negative emotions to get more in a relationship. It never works. Okay, it never ever works to use negative emotions to get more to try to change your partner. And what we call that is complaining, disapproving, nagging, rhetorical questions. Why did you say that? Why would you do that? How come you would do this and this and this? Why? You know, this is how women, when they feel their negative emotions, they think that if I share that with my partner, they'll change. And it doesn't work, does it? <laughs> it just doesn't work. But you see, we have a primitive brain with conditioning. <clears throat> and if somebody steps on your foot and you don't know how to communicate effectively, then you just make a big noise <laughs> and to get the person to stop stepping on your foot. But it turns out that with humans and relationships, particularly intimate relationships, we're talking about personal relationships where somebody really loves you and cares about you. If you use negativity uh, to communicate to them, they're just going to resist and continue doing what they do to various degrees. And then you have more justification to have negative emotions, which then cause your partner to do even less and less and less. Now, I'm not saying that you're completely responsible for the problems, but if you're a woman using complaining and nagging and rhetorical questions and disapproving uh, or giving unsolicited advice, you know, because you're dissatisfied, you want, you want to quote, help him, 
but really <laughs> the help you want is going to make your life better. And so if he's not wanting your advice, don't give it. And if you've got negative emotions, don't share them. Uh, because what that does is now we understand the new science of brain plasticity is that every time you have a negative emotion uh, and you use it to get what you want, you actually create a pathway in your brain to have a bias towards looking at negativity. This is like, it's, your brain just gets in the habit of feeling negative emotions. It's kind of like if, if that water makes me feel good, then if I'm thirsty, I'm gonna go drink that water. Uh, just like that. It's, the brain learns, okay, if I want something from my partner and I share negative emotions, then my brain goes, oh, okay, so you need to have negative emotions whenever you're not getting what you want. So over time, a woman's negative emotions get stronger and stronger and stronger until what she has to do is push them down again and again and again and again. And that kills the passion in a relationship. So, you know, this is, this is unfortunately a negative groove that, that goes on in relationships. Now, men, on the other hand, are more vulnerable to addiction. Uh, and so what happens for men is when they're feeling somewhat depressed or down or whatever, when they're feeling not fulfilled, they'll often go for a stimulant. And that stimulant will make them feel good. So now their need for the stimulant increases, increases the pathways in the brain, grow stronger and stronger. And the problem is when, you're, when the pathways in your brain go towards going to the stimulant, they're no longer going to you. Mm. <clears throat> you see, I have the power yeah. to become happy and fulfilled. That's empowerment. <clears throat> a woman has the power to get what she wants in a relationship if she uses love and not complaints. Men have the power to feel good through their actions, through their mental states, through their behaviors. And if I not feeling good, I need to do something to feel good as opposed to become passive and depend on something. <clears throat> so dependence is the, the danger for men and independence is the danger for women where they feel, oh, I have to solve the problem. Now, these are extreme statements I understand. They're brilliant statements. You see, we need clarity in our lives. And we see that women today are not able to maintain their sexual attraction to their partner. They lose interest in sex. They lose interest in relationships. They can't get married. No man is good enough. They're dissatisfied. Their stress levels are higher. They feel overwhelmed. They feel like they have no time. And they've created a story to justify all that, okay? The stories we tell ourselves are just to justify how we feel. And then you create that story. Uh, and so, yeah, you can look around and say, oh, I have to work all these hours because I'm a single woman. Well, why are you a single woman and with children? Because you started with being too independent in the relationship where you used your emotions to get what you want rather than learn how to receive support. So these are all, you know, beyond people's normal thinking process, what I cover in my books. And I'll mention that while we're talking about how to get what you want book, this whole idea of, of using negativity to get what you want or men becoming addicted uh, to feel good rather than their own ability to feel good that's not dependent on anyone other than themselves. Uh, this is, these are like our power positions. That's all in my book, Beyond Mars and Venus. Uh, you've read that? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Or, yeah. Of course, of course, you've read all my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> are you watching my Facebook lives? I'm just curious. Yeah, some, sometimes we are watching. Sometimes. Yeah, with They're the, long, yeah. they're long. <laughs> well, no, we, we are. I mean, I, I just recently got engaged uh, and uh, we, are, we are watching together. Yeah. Congratulations, congratulations. Thank you, well, thank you. you know, this is the easiest time to begin practicing these things because uh, these grooves in the brain, they slowly grow over time. Like one, one groove that was in the brain for Bonnie was, uh, I have a, we, we have a big house and I walk through the house and there's what light switches all the way along the way. And there's a, you know, there's a basic concept if women could understand this about men, they would have less frustration with us. Because when you understand something, you feel no frustration. It's only frustration and anger and all that. We don't understand something. Why is it that way? I can't believe it. Why, 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 why? You know, uh, because we don't understand. Well, 
I'm an emergency man, okay? Most men are, which means we have faster reaction time, we have higher testosterone, and even your average man has 10 times more testosterone than the average woman, and that gives you faster reaction time. I'm like 30 or 40 times the average woman, you know? So I'm a fast acting, I'd like to drive fast, I write books fast, I do things fast. That's just my speed. My wife said, yeah, that's the way John is. He's fast when it comes to sex. And I, and I said, yes, but I can drive for three hours. <laughs> he said he, 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 he has sex the way he drives because I drive fast. But uh, <laughs> however, let me put a caution note in there, which is um, uh, when I'm driving my wife, and of course I'm talking to her in present time, but we, you discussed already, my wife passed a couple of years ago. And I, I'm getting over the grieving process. You know, I can tear up in a second if I let myself, but I, I miss her deeply, but I'm moving on. And, but anyway, when I drive in the car with her, I give examples with her. And if I'm going too fast, she just puts her hand up like that and holds the handle and I slow down. That was a simple solution. And I put my hand on her thigh and I say, and that was for you. And she says, yes, it was. And I appreciate it. So it's a moment of intimacy. <laughs> for her to feel like she is safe. Because see, when women feel safe, their female hormones increase, their well-being increases. When men feel successful, their well-being increases. And when my, and that's happiness, okay? And so when my happiness is dependent upon my addiction, I become weaker and weaker and weaker. Mm. Uh, now, if we look at relationships, um, the number one addiction for women, as I mentioned, is these verbal complaints and so forth this attitude which tries to uh, make a man change. And that just doesn't work. We can get to what she can do to let go of that negativity and then get what she wants. But the first thing is we've got to recognize what we're doing is sabotage. Now, the thing for men is we are addicted to sex. Okay, so now I have sex every day with my girlfriend because I don't ejaculate. But most men ejaculate when they have sex. And that, that's a whole lesson in itself. But when I was married to Bonnie, many, for much of the time I didn't ejaculate and much of the time I did. So, it was, you know, 23 year marriage. So I went back and forth. I hadn't yet mastered the ability to not ejaculate for a long time uh, in that marriage. Now, I, you know, I gradually got to that point. But the, the whole idea of addiction, the most addictive thing there is in the human body for men is ejaculation. Just to know that. And the Japanese did research on this and they showed that if a man ejaculates with his wife on Saturday night, if he goes for six days without ejaculating, his testosterone levels will double. See, everything in men is testosterone, uh, well-being. You feel, whenever you feel successful, your testosterone levels go up. And when you don't feel successful, your testosterone levels go down and you're and if you're in a relationship with a woman, your estrogen levels will go higher. Uh, estrogen is when you feel love and connection and happiness and joy and ease and comfort. Just like how you feel when you're having your addiction, man. That's pure estrogen, okay? So <laughs> dependence. Mm -hmm. So I'm, when I'm depending on something outside myself for my happiness. Now, if you don't ejaculate, then the whole time you're not depending on that surge of estrogen to be happy. So if, you, if you're still wanting to be addicted to ejaculation, I'm quite free of it and very glad to be there. Um, but if you, what men don't understand is when you finally overcome the, the need to ejaculate, and I, I did this back in my 20s. As you know, I was a, a celibate monk for nine years and I, I learned to sublimate, sublimate my sexual energy through meditation. Uh, so I never ejaculated for, for nine years. And the semen was so much in my body, you could actually smell it under my arms when I perspired. It was an amazing time of spiritual experiences. Uh, and now once again, it's an amazing time. At, once I mastered having sex without ejaculating, the spiritual experiences are all, are all back again. It, it just, it's fuel for the brain, for the higher consciousness if you don't ejaculate. But I, I shouldn't talk too much about it because I know men are going <laughs> to ejaculate. But let's just, let's just look at the, the thing you can control, which is you can control just ejaculating once a week uh, because you do have a recovery period. And if you don't ejaculate more than once a week, you, you're, you're not, your testosterone levels aren't going to double. And that's with 25-year-olds. 
okay? And the Dow, and, and that's been measured now in science. Now, what we see happening as a common theme is with the pornography, which is now available online, it is the most massive addiction on the planet today with men. Okay, it is, it's mm -hmm. huge. Now some women are doing it and women can be like men with all the things I'm saying and men can be like women with all the things I'm saying, of course. But as a general theme, mostly it's uh, men going onto these porn sites and in eight minutes they're done. That's the average. This is throwing your life force away. This is yeah. weakening your testosterone. So let's look at some symptoms for men of low testosterone and high estrogen, anger. Anytime a man is angry, it's low testosterone. And that's the opposite of what people think because science and still, so I look on the articles online and some of the articles still associate testosterone with aggressiveness. But the more recent and the recent studies of the last decade have shown that a man's aggressiveness is when he has high testosterone, but he loses confidence. If he loses confidence, now his estrogen levels are rising and his testosterone is going down. Uh, fear is estrogen. So if I'm afraid, uh, that's what causes aggression. Men are not aggressive if they're not afraid. And you know, if, if there's an angry man, you might say to him, oh, John, you're just, ang you're just afraid. No man's gonna say I'm afraid because he, he's not aware of the depth of his feelings. But if you're not afraid, you never get angry. I mean, come on, you're cool, calm and collected. You can solve the problem, no big deal. All right, I'll get to it. Or there's nothing I can do about it, so let it go. So it's always the fear. And just to put a, a and this always for women as well, it's their fears that give rise to anger and sadness and disappointment. You know, when you see the woman demonstrating, you know, I feel offended, I'm so angry at men and all this. It's just like, they're afraid. They're afraid I can't depend on men. I can't get what I want. I have to do it myself. So fear is a major stress reducer. And if we want to go deeper, because you go deeper in your work and, and, and how to get what you want, want what you have really gets, how do you create maximum success in your life and fulfillment and soulmates and all that great stuff. When you're angry, you're always disappointed about something. So there's always some sadness there. You have to go deep into it. And whenever you're disappointed and sad, if it's painful, it's because some part of you is afraid you'll never get what you want. So you got to feel those emotions. You got to become aware of the crazy inside of you. All negative emotions are the crazy inside of you, period. Negative emotions are the crazy inside of us. Okay. They serve no function. If we're monkeys, they serve a lot of function. But if you have communication skills, it's love that gets you where you want to go. And I'll say this because this is in our intimate relationships. All right, let's st start with that because here you're with somebody who actually loves you. Now, if, if somebody is a, 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 a you know, a elephant attacking me, I might have to shoot it, okay? So, you know, there's a place for violence and all that stuff from a cool, calm and collected place. But, because communication doesn't work with animals. And when somebody's an animal over there, a person behaving like an animal, communication doesn't work either. So there's many different realities here to what I'm t teaching. But when you're in an intimate relationship, you're newly engaged, uh, newly married or engaged? Engaged, engaged. Okay, it's the sweetest time that there is, okay? This is this wonderful opportunity to grow positive neural connectors in the brain, positive pathways. Many people rush into marriage and they don't create enough time to grow the positive pathways that say when there's disagreements, we can get over them quite easily. Because in the newness of a relationship, you get the added balance of uh, the ad added benefit of newness. You have no history together to have negativity, no pa pathways built up with them. And you also well, have, have some already. <laughs> yeah. and, and newness stimulates testosterone in men and stimulates estrogen in women when you feel safe. So you're getting, you're getting a glimpse of what's possible when you work out the kinks in your relationship for a lifetime. So you want to yeah. start out with that good feeling. And so here's an example of the groove. So in my house, I'm walking through the house. I leave the, I'm an emergency man. I was being playful with that term, but all men to a great extent are emergency men because our testosterone is so much higher than women. And when you're an emergency man, if there's an emergency, what do you have to do? You have to drop everything, <laughs> drop everything. So for me, it's like, I don't look behind me. I'm always going forward, always going forward. So my poor wife, <laughs> You know, John would leave the lights on and she'd follow behind later and turn the lights out. And what happens is she was annoyed by it. She would mention it to me. It didn't change. 
she got more annoyed by it. You see, if you're annoyed once and you communicate, you think, oh, now the problem's solved. But then it happens again. Now you're a little more annoyed, a little more annoyed. And that groove is there. Mm -hmm. Now you're walking to the house and you immediately notice that life was left on. And then you start to interpret. This is where women go really south is they start to interpret. If he doesn't turn the light out, that means, what does that mean? Does it mean our electric bill is going to be too high? That was in the beginning what it meant. Now it means he doesn't love me. That means he won't change for me. That means he doesn't care for me. And is that true? Of course not. I would give my life for her. I would do everything for her. You know, just that's why I work so hard and my family and the happiness. Of course that's true. But the brain sees that light on and immediately goes, oh, if he doesn't turn that light out, that means he doesn't love me. See, this is what we do as human beings. And what we want to do is recognize it. All those negative emotions are simply misinterpretations of reality. And we have to learn to become flexible with them, mm -hmm. which is to recognize every negative emotion has a thought, whether conscious or not, that is causing that negative emotion. Every negative emotion has a thought linked to it. So the thought there is when she got really upset about it was the thought that, he doesn't love me. Okay, so if you're telling yourself, he doesn't love me, of course, yourself is going to panic. Oh my God, I'm married to some guy who doesn't love me. He can leave me. I'll be left over. I can't depend on him. I have to do it myself. And now you're back to the dilemma of women today, feeling I have to do it myself. And then, and then they use their negativity in order to do it themselves. Okay, if I just throw this on you and punish you and withhold sex from you and be critical of you and withdraw from you, all those mechanisms are there, and which are primitive. They're primitive behaviors. They're what monkeys do, animals do this, but humans have the ability to go beyond it. And that's what we're trying to do if we wanna create a lifetime of great sex, passion, love, intimacy, safety. Just imagine coming home, women, and you want to talk about your day and your husband is so interested and in what's going on, whether it be positive or negative, and he gives you a big hug. You feel safe to express how you feel, what you think. And you don't have to share what you feel or think about him, okay? Because he's so wonderful, right? You're, you're feeling so appreciative. There's nothing negative to say about him. So you're, you're just able to express the stresses of your day. And he's going to feel empathy and compassion for you and not try to fix you or solve you, but just be attentive to you, realizing you're having a hard day. He's not judging you for having a bad mood. See, that's safety to be yourself. Well, women, you know how that would feel so great. Well, imagine what a man wants to feel. He wants to come home and feel the safety that nobody's going to judge me for being not good enough. He wants to come home as a hero, a successful guy, amazing guy. He worked really hard. Maybe he lost all the money, but he worked really hard losing all the money because he cared. <laughs> you know, this is, we got to get beyond our negativity and our judgmentalness. And that's called following your heart. Your heart is open. You feel loving, you feel accepting, you feel forgiving, you feel compassionate, you feel generous, you feel uh, allowing, you feel receptive. This is what we want. And you know, sometimes a man has an affair and a woman says, what do I do? What do I do? I said, well, what do you want to happen? And, and well, uh, often she says, well, I want to be married to him, but I can't now. And I said, well, yeah, you can. And sometimes a woman says, well, I'm going to get a divorce because he had an affair. And I go, well, what if he didn't have an affair? Would you want to be married to him? Yes. Okay. So you want to be married to him. Forgive the affair and be married to him. You know, People usually use uh, affairs as to justify leaving a relationship they want to leave anyway without having to blame themselves. See, we don't want to look at ourselves as the source of our misery. Nobody is the source of our misery. It looks that way. I get it. It always looks that way. This happened to me. This happened to me. But how do we respond to what happens to us? That's, the, that's, the, that's how we come back to our heart. So back to your first question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I give long answers. That's why I, I talk know. for hours. <laughs> but I think it's all good information. Sure. Is that when you go to that level of feeling your frustrations, your anger, your sadness, your disappointments, your fears, your insecurities, your doubts, always if those are if those are feeling like they don't, if you feel them and they don't let it go right away. Sometimes you feel negativity, you just let it go. But if it sticks, and usually it sticks, you know, people it's sticking inside your stress. 
It's because there's always a deeper feeling under it, a deeper emotion under it. And the emotion underneath all those three, anger, sadness, fear, is feeling unworthy or inadequate. Mm. And ironically, the person who's angry, remember, they're never going to say, I'm afraid because they're angry. Actually, the person who's angry is feeling unworthy or inadequate. Because when you feel worthy and adequate, you don't get angry about anything because you feel like, oh, I deserve, I'll get it, okay? Because I have the power to get it because I'm worthy. But it's when we're, when we're not feeling worthy. And when I say that, people are not aware of these feelings inside. You see, this is a journey of consciousness. This is a journey of awareness. Starting to become aware that all of our stresses inside of us are linked to negative emotions. Those negative emotions are linked to thoughts and thoughts, this is the great thing about thoughts. Thoughts are way more flexible than emotions, okay? Thoughts, you can stay in negative emotions for the rest of your life, okay? You just mm -hmm. get stuck in negative emotions. You wanna get in touch with the thought that's linked to the emotions because you can change a thought very easily. You can't change emotions. If you're angry, it's hard to just let it go. But you can look at what thought, what belief system do I have right now? You know, my husband, he turns out the lights, it hurts my feelings now. It hurts me <laughs> like I actually hurt her. This is nonsense, of course. And if she said, you know, I feel like you don't love me and that hurts, I wouldn't say this is nonsense. You never do that to somebody. You let them ex discover their craziness on their own by letting it go. Now, when women let go of negativity, I'll just give you a hint all to the, all the men listening. They don't come back and say, I was a bit crazy. <laughs> they never do. Uh, nobody wants to admit that they're crazy because we're not crazy. It's just negative emotions are irrational. They're non-logical. And logic doesn't always have heart associated with it. So I'm not saying logic is the best, but the thing about logic, our thoughts, is they can change more quickly than our emotions. So if you basically can identify the thoughts that you're having with the emotions, then it's easier to go deeper into the emotion to let it go. Because you got to get all the way down to the bottom before you can let it go. Back to that bottom feeling of unworthiness. Uh, on the surface, that might feel like guilt. That might feel like shame. Uh, you, you're looking at what you did to contribute to the problem. Now, one thing is processing your emotions to get down to the feeling of, of guilt that I'm contributing to this problem, regret. I shouldn't have done this, I should have done that, is lack of knowledge, okay? I mean, unless somebody's read my books, they're, they're gonna always feel justified in complaining about their partner. <laughs> you see, you, you gotta realize what you're doing wrong. If somebody doesn't point out to you lovingly, hopefully this comes across as lovingly, because we don't know better. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. We don't realize how we're different and we don't know ourselves anymore. That's the, what's happened there. Where, where are you right now? In we're, Finland, Helsinki. Oh, in Finland. Okay, so you're a Scandinavian area. Yes. You know, yes. Nobody knows their men and women there. Excuse me for those that do. But gender neutrality is live mm -hmm. there. <laughs> this is like craziness. Gender neutrality. Uh, are you kidding? If you look at the biology of men and women, it's so clear that when you're unhappy, men's testosterone is low. And women's estrogen is low. Women's testosterone levels are, she's producing testosterone. She may not make a lot, but she's not in making the estrogen. So when estrogen is low in women, because they're not depending on a man, do me, help me, support me. Oh, I don't need a man. I don't need a man. I should, we should all do ourselves. No, relationship is inter interdependence. And what does interdependence mean if it's a man and a woman? It means she depends on him for certain things and he feels his happiness is dependent upon being the solution to her problems. Mm. And there is a dynamic here. I write about it in my book, uh, Beyond Mars and Venus called pair bonding. Pair bonding is different from social bonding. Social bonding produces progesterone in women and pair bonding produces estrogen in women. Half of the month, women need more estrogen and half of the month, women need more progesterone and some estrogen. So pair bonding is where you're not depending on someone, but you're being helpful and having fun and interacting, but there's no dependence, but you're feeling good. Okay, it's something you enjoy doing. It could be doing for yourself, helping yourself or helping others. 
but you're not depending on them for anything. So you're not working. You're not making money at that time. You're not dependent on them. You might be a little dependent and that would be, but on, on after your period all the way up to ovulation, that's where women have to primarily make estrogen and estrogen is produced in pair bonding. Pair bonding is an ideal pair bonding set is you go to your doctor and you feel, oh, maybe I have COVID. Will you help me doctor? So you're frightened and you look to him for advice and direction. Okay, so now you're pair bonding. That means you're depending on someone to be there for you. And the doctor, whether it be a man or woman, gets to feel, yes, I'm important. I have, I have a, I have a skill set here. I can help you. I'm successful. That's the male-female relationship. And it's really tricky to maintain passion uh, in a relationship if you don't have the male-female the, the male -female polarity. Mm -hmm. Now, gay couples, there's so many gay couples now because this gender neutrality, nobody knows how to interdepend on each other. So many women just don't trust men because they don't know how to get what they need from men. So being with another woman is much easier. And men are so addicted to ejaculation. Boy, if you get to be a gay man, you can do it five times a night with somebody. But the whole time is you're addicted to sex. I'm not saying only gay men are addicted to sex. I'm saying also straight men now are addicted to sex. And what's happening as the ones who started as teenagers with pornography, by the age they're 21, very con a new phenomenon is impotence. Men being impotent with a woman at 21. How wow. could that be? Wow. <laughs> and it's all about low testosterone as a result of high estrogen. Because you see, when you're having porn sex, you're not making any estrogen. There's no relationship, there's no love, there's no connection, there's no touch. These all stimulate estrogen that keeps testosterone from going so high. They balance each other. Whereas now you're on the, you're doing porn, no estrogen is being produced. So your testosterone levels surge up. You already have low testosterone. So you're looking for the easy fix like cocaine. And it lights up the brain just like you're taking cocaine, changes the brain like you're taking cocaine. But when you ejaculate, what just happened, you got a surge of testosterone, but it feels so good. That's your estrogen. Anything that feels so good, that's estrogen. And then it feels really good. And you get a big burst of dopamine, which makes it addictive and a big dose of estrogen that knocks down your testosterone. So now you're craving it again and craving it again, and you're losing your life force. So Tom, yeah. On Sorry, I had to break your flow. I, no, I, no, no, I, I know <laughs> I'm just going, it's my thought for the day. <laughs> no, it's great, it's great. I, uh, and I, it's just a clarification. I kind of know part of the answer already, what you're saying here with, the, for example, with the example you give about turning off the li lights. I think on the same token, and I know you uh, teach this on the book, uh, with using the same logic, we men can also kind of uh, program our brain with neuroplasticity to see those little things as doing something good if we understand also that little things can kind of mean a lot for a woman. And uh, how do you see that play into this, into this balance? Okay, so you just brought out another one of the big Mars-Venus themes that changes people's lives, which is men don't understand women. And when you understand women, you can be more successful with less effort. Do less and get more. I mean, who doesn't want that if you're a man? We, it's that emergency man is always wanting to only do what you have to do, only do what you have to do, which women often think is laziness. Men see it as efficiency. Okay, if I have to do it. So a man, he's dating. So you've been dating for a while and you know, see a dating man, thinks, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for her dinner. I'll do this. I'll plan this. I'll give her compliments. I'll get all these little things. And that's what you do in the dating process. And ironically, that's what you do in your mind as a man. You're doing the little stuff, but you're not going to give her half your income. You're not going to be monogamous with her. You're not going to give your life to her. You're not going to seal the deal for a lifetime with her. <laughs> that's big stuff, right? So once you decide you're going to do big stuff, you think, why bother with the little stuff? Because it's true, when you do the big stuff, she's so happy, oh, you're gonna marry me, we're gonna live forever, all this wonderful stuff. So the man goes, all right, I'm doing the big stuff now, why do the little stuff? And he doesn't know that the little stuff is just as important as the big stuff. You only get married once, okay, hopefully. And the little stuff we do every day. 
So the marriage is, yeah, it's a big thing. So let's look at biology of the concept that every act of love from a man to a woman, every act of love has the equal reaction, whether the act was big or little, big or little. And you actually have to realize that in women, whether they're aware or not, there is this scoring system. It'd be great if there wasn't, that's called, you owe me. Yeah, we wanna get rid of that, but there is a scoring system biologically. And it just kicks into gear for her, whether she's aware of it or not. And that is, women will say to me when they're unhappy, I give and give and give and I don't get back. Well, what is that? That's a score system. I did this and I did this, I did this and I didn't get back. And we wanna get out of that. But one of the things we can learn is the system of what generates those feelings of resentment in her. So from the man's point of view, I wanna minimize her ability to resent me, all right? So from that perspective, I realize I can make million dollars, that's gonna be one point. <laughs> that's one act of love. I can work hard today and not make a lot of money, but I worked hard, that's the same point. I can give her 500 roses, that's gonna, she's gonna go, oh, 500 roses, that's wonderful. Maybe you got two points for that. I can bring her one rose and that's one point. I can bring her another rose the next week, another rose, another rose. And so I'm making points, but I can also listen to her every time she changes the subject and I'm still interested, that's a point. Every time I offer to help her in something, that's a point. Every time I give her a hug, that's a point. Every time I'm patient with her, that's a point. Every time uh, I uh, run to do something for her, quick response, that's a point. Everything I do, every time I turn out that light, that's a point, unless, unless she thinks you should do it. <laughs> you should do that. That's the problem. You don't get any points when, when women have what I'll call low estrogen. Now see, when women are stressed, they have low estrogen. So the research shows that you can give her a million dollars or one dollar if her estrogen levels are low, it'll have a very little effect. It's kind of like the, the woman who feels ignored and neglected and resentful and the husband comes home with the diamond ring and says here honey and she says you think you can buy my love and throws the diamond ring away <laughs> that's just like a funny story but it makes the point you see it sometimes in the movies you can't buy my love but you actually instead of bringing the diamond ring which you think is a thousand points you need to start earning a thousand points by doing a lot of little things but here's the biology of that if a woman has normal estrogen Okay, she's healthy, her stress levels aren't high. You give her 50 roses or one rose, it has the same surge of estrogen taking her higher and fulfilling your purpose as a man. You see, as a man, whether we know it or not, our purpose is not to make a woman happy. We feel if we can make her happy, we feel great. That's not our purpose in a relationship. A relationship is supposed to be two adults who are capable of finding their happiness independent of each other. Then what, what does a woman need us for? Well, she needs us to become happier. See, that's the whole confusion today is that you make me happy, you don't make me happy. No, you, you make me happier. And if you're not making me happier, that's okay, I'm still happy. And you, I don't have to be happier all the time. So there's a baseline. If, if my wife, I have to already feel successful as a man. Then if my, I can make my wife happier, I feel more successful. And that is the truth. Uh, unfortunately, successful men end up getting divorced quite often because they don't, they, their testosterone goes down when they get home because they don't feel successful with their wives at all. And they don't feel successful with their wives all because their wives are not happy and their wives are not happy because he thinks money alone is gonna make her happy. Money every day, money comes in, that's one point. That's one point, unless, now there's an exception here as well. If, if uh, you need the money, I mean, you really need the money, you're hungry, okay? When you're hungry and you don't have a house to live in, now you're at a, uh, a survival level. When you're at a survival level, romance is not so important. Getting food is more important. So we have something Dr. Maslow talked about last century which is the hierarchy of needs. When you're in a place where you have survival needs, love needs are just not that important. Uh, you, you do whatever it takes to get your food and you'll appreciate whoever gives it to you. But once, once you're in the place of emotional fulfillment, uh, once your survival needs are fulfilled, now you're in a place of emotional fulfillment and emotional fulfillment looks like 
freedom to express both my male and female sides. That's what's going on now. That's what's going on in Finland. It was very civilized society, smart people, consciously aware, higher consciousness. I, you know, people talk in the new age movement about ascension. We've already ascended. The ascension is the capacity to self-reflect and regulate our male and female sides. It put it from that perspective. Another perspective is to regulate all reactivity inside of us. We now have the potential to reflect on it and question it and change the conditioning, change the conditioning, change the brain plasticity. You see, monkeys right. can't do that. Mm -hmm. They're going to take uh, millions of years to evolve. Okay, it's a slow evolutionary process. Somehow something happened to humans where we've got this little bit of prefrontal cortex here, which has human DNA, different from monkeys. And that's the part of us that can, we can self-reflect and say, hey, I'm, I'm complaining all the time, doesn't seem to work. So let me find another solution to that. But if you don't have that self-reflection, you're just going to keep doing the same thing monkeys do. So in your addictions, you know, men with their addictions, if they can't recognize that, you know, when I do this, uh, it makes me fat, makes me feel bad. It kills my libido. Uh, it, it feels good to start with, but afterwards makes me feel awful. Maybe I need to find something that feels good and keeps me feeling good. What so about I've got a yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are uh, great points. And I think uh, uh, you, you already thought so many of my questions and there's so many million places I would love to go explore more. But I'm, I'm thinking that what, what do you then think with the current times as you touched upon like uh, these different forms of relationships, for example, there's also a lot of talk about polyamory, Tinder dates, oh, one it's night nonsense. stands. So what, how, do, how would you then sell people on the idea of monogamy if a lot of people think ah it's old fashioned it's out of the yeah yeah they they don't know the possibility they don't know the possibilities of great sex i'm telling you you know there's not a cell in my body that would ever leave bonnie because every week we had great sex we're talking about because see it doubled my testosterone if you don't ejaculate during the week if you only have sex once a week it's like heaven or you could have sex every day. Sometimes I'd have to sex every day with her and I didn't ejaculate. Uh, I hadn't fully mastered it throughout the relationship because if you don't fully master the technique and you don't ejaculate, you can feel sore balls. Mm. And so, so then I would have to go out and exercise to get the energy throughout my whole body. <laughs> so there's a Is whole there a science to it. Was that, that, do, do you have a technique? Have you thought about, because uh, I, I, I talk about this with a lot of guys here. And there is a lot of interest on people understanding this more. And I wish I would have understood more from the youth of how to just convert the sexual energy into more productive things. And I, I think it's a very important subject. Do, do you have some techniques that you develop? Oh, of course. It's not, it, well, it's, it's like trying to teach you to throw a basketball. <laughs> I can't do it on, online. It's a class I teach. Okay. Uh, the first step the first step, and, and you'll, you'll never be able to get to the advanced technique until you do the first step. The first step is stop, eject, stop, stop masturbation. That's the first step. If you're not in a relationship, you get horny. You'll get an erection. You can't sleep. You got this big erection sitting there. Then what you do is you stroke it with a feather touch without using picture or pornography, and your goal is to have it last 30 minutes. Okay, it will go away after that. 30 minutes and never getting to the point of inevitability where you would have an ejaculation. So ejaculation happens. Prior to that, there's something called a plateau. Now the plateau, is, first is arousal, erection. Now it's gonna be there for a while and then you see, an, an, and if you were to continue touching yourself or having sex at that point within 10 seconds or 30 seconds, you're gonna ejaculate. So that's called the point of inevitability. So what you have to do is long before you get to the point of inevitability, you have to let your energy go down. You can't get to the point of inevitability. There's a whole zone there. You can't, you, your objective is I'm not gonna get to the point of inevitability. Point, that, that point is where you can stop yourself from ejaculating, but you're gonna have big sore balls. That's for mm. sure. That's uh, painful and it's not good for you. And you know, there've been times where I got prostatitis because I was uh, 
addicted to getting as much pleasure as I could rather than setting a different goal. Mm. The goal is keep an erection without even getting close to the point of inevitability. So any single man should start doing that. Give up ejaculating completely and just get to that and, and, you, and never look at porn. Uh, and I'm not against a, a good movie with a good naked scene or something. There's nothing wrong with that because you're in a movie theater, you're with other people, you're not going to masturbate. <laughs> so you're able to keep it somewhat in control there. Uh, you know, I think when naked women are beautiful, um, it, that's a, an intimacy can be beautiful uh, and too much is not. And just for the point of sex is worthless. Uh, so that's pornography because your, your life force as men, mm -hmm. even if you look at the biology of it, every time you ejaculate, you lose a lot of zinc mm -hmm. and zinc's necessary to make your testosterone. But there's a lot more that goes along with it. There's the hormonal shift that occurs when you ejaculate, which is you go up to high estrogen, low testosterone that continues your testosterone levels to be lower and lower, causing you to crave the high dopamine stimulation, the surge of testosterone, from pornography, which then results in high estrogen that knocks you down. And notice how you feel, guys, after you ejaculate. You feel awful, you know? And, and what's interesting is people will often go, well, yeah, well, I feel ashamed afterwards, but that's only cultural conditioning. No, that's your soul telling you, you just <laughs> lost a bundle, buddy. All you right. know, and, and the culture, see our culture used to shame people for masturbating mm -hmm. because we lived in a culture of shame. I don't live in the culture of shame. I live in the culture of what works and what doesn't work. We're all lovable. We all deserve to be loved. Nobody deserves to be punished. That's what's great about Finland. I've heard about your, your, what you do with your prisoners is the objective yeah. is rehabilitation and not mm -hmm. punishment. That's, see, it's an enlightened country, but the problem here, and I'm an enlightened being, you're an enlightened being. When you're enlightened, you've ascended. Now what happens is you have the ability to self-reflect. That self-reflection ability only comes when you have a balance of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. okay? The balance of masculine and feminine means that you can easily go to your female side or your male side. But if you're a man, it's easier to go to your female side. And if you're a woman, it's easier to go to your male side. And then it's harder to get back to your female side. And for men, it's harder to get back to your male side. So let's look at an example. For me, as a man, addiction, going with, we'll just do ice cream, for example, okay? Ice cream dose. is not good for me in big doses, but oh, it feels so good, doesn't it? It's pleasure. I depend on ice cream. Oh, I can feel so good eating my mm -hmm. ice cream. I can just keep going and going and going. And now I'm gonna get fat and passive. My energy will be lower the next day. All right, so I know that's not good for me. A little bit's okay, no big deal. So that's an addiction. Now it could be much worse than that. It could be ejaculation, for example. No, now, now, what about then from a woman's perspective? Do you say that the same benefit for monogamy is great sex for women? Oh, I haven't as well? gotten to the point of monogamy. So let, let me come back to that point. It's so key. Okay, when you have great sex, it just gets better and better and better. Polyamorous people don't have great sex. I live in Marin County. And the, all these polyamorous people, that so, so much complication of jealousy and all these issues. And some people say, yes, helps me to deal with my jealousy. Okay, <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could have fun with that if you want. But your, the whole premise is I'm not satisfied, fully satisfied with the person I love most. See, the purpose of sex, okay, let me get this clear. The purpose of sex, if you're a monkey, is procreation. The purpose of sex, if you're a primitive, is pleasure. The purpose of sex is to grow in love. Sex bonds us more if it's done properly. Sex allows men to grow in love and allows women to bring their love into their body. See, women live in their brains all the time. They're thinking too much, thinking too much. Men live in their cock too much. What we wanna do is bring our sexual energy and let it come up to our heart and into our mind. Then the world, see my sexual energy is in my heart and in my mind. So when I go out, I see trees. I, I do have big tall trees where I live and I feel like I'm walking through the Grand Canyon. I'm in awe of how beautiful it is. I'm in awe of the gorgeousness of nature. That's because that sexual energy has come to my heart and my brain. Just the same pleasure, you know, every man looks at a woman's body and at a certain point in sex, you go, oh my God, it's so beautiful. You wanna just take it in, you wanna absorb it. 
Well, imagine you have that for the whole world. See, that's sex sublimation. And that only happens that in Taoism and Tantra, there's all these breathing techniques and all this uh, control. That's all old fashioned stuff, you see. That's not ascension stuff. Ascension stuff is the technique of first healing the addiction. I told men how they can start that process. But the second is you elevate the sexual experience through love. That's the only purpose of it is to lo feel love mm. and awakens men so for me, the only reason I ever want to have sex is it increases my love for someone, helps me to get more in touch with my love. And the more someone loves you, the more you're going to go there. The longer you know them, the greater that can be. It's kind of like if you look at an old friend, nobody can ever replace an old friend. It takes time for things to grow. Well, if you can be monogamous with somebody and you can easily be there if you know how to have great sex. Mm. So the purpose, the reason why people think divorce is outdated is because they're not satisfied. A marriage is outdated. They're not satisfied in their marriage. They don't know that two souls creating a partnership can go to a highest level of spiritual attainment on this planet because it brings in that light into your body. And these are possibilities for people. Right. This is not so far strong. Historically, it was impossible. Okay. This was not possible in the past because we had not ascended. Ascension is now some people had, you know, there's always a few geniuses along the way. But in Finland, oh my God, almost everybody has the ability to go to their female side or their male side. And when you can choose, now you can find balance. And when you can find balance, that's where genius comes out in terms of your service to the world, you become genius. But the foundation for that, the foundation for that is relationship. You need to find your genius in relationship as a foundation for really being successful and making this world a better place. Why is there so much craziness and polarity and, and negative polarity? I mean, in, in America, the worst. I don't know what it is everywhere else, but oh my God, craziness. They hate each other. They hate each other. Mm. Um, having said that, what, when women go to their male side, what are they saying? I don't need a man. I can't trust a man. Men betray me. Men hurt me. Men are not there for me. I have to do it all myself. Right. So it's a complete rejection of one side. Mm -hmm. And ironically, when you're on your male side, you're not embracing your female side. If you're a woman, you, you lost the power of your female side. Women think our power comes from running the world. Your power is love. Right. When you know that here, let me define the yin and the yang in terms of power. The masculine side, look what I can do, okay? Look what I can accomplish, look what I can achieve. The female side of it says, look what I don't have to do, people do for me. <laughs> I don't have to worry about this. I have all this support coming. I have money that keeps it coming into me. That's my female side. I don't have to work. I got certain things that money just keeps coming to me. But if I just went to my female side, I'd become depressed, I'd become an alcoholic, I'd become a drug addict, I wouldn't be able to have great sex. You see, you've got to have the balance inside. And, and when I say that, women have to find their power on their female side. I'm not in any way implying that women should not find the power on their male side as well. See, this is great. Women rulers, women business exec, women you know, running the world in various ways, just like men run the world in various ways. There's no gender difference there, except that when women are on their male side, because we don't have this training, it tends to interfere with their marriage. It tends to interfere with their ability to have orgasm. It tends to cause higher stress levels. It tends to cause more disease problems. All of that is because women are not finding their balance. And the flip side of that is true for men. Men cannot sustain erection. They can't sustain commitment. They can't follow through. They procrastinate. They're passive. They have addictions. They lose their power because they're over on their female side too much. Does it mean he can't ejaculate? Well, if you want to ejaculate, only do it once a week. If you, if you want to be Superman, okay, then you know, give up ejaculation altogether, but have sex mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. you know, Mind-blowing sex, that's a possibility. Now, when mm -hmm. you have mind-blowing sex like that, the thought of another woman, oh my God, that's just complication. I don't need that when you're totally satisfied. See, that's the key. It's the dissatisfaction people feel, which leads them to a polyamorous. And I think for a lot of homosexual relationships, it's their dissatisfaction that they feel, with the, for women particularly, with the opposite sex. They can't trust men. So easier to be with a woman. And the problem with homosexuality is that if you're a woman having some homosexual experience, it causes estrogen levels to soar 
and then they go back down and now you crave the estrogen experience and you can't go with a man. The same thing for a man. If you have low testosterone and you have sex with a man, it's even more powerful than pornography. Right. So it becomes an addiction. So, you know, if you're kind of a young guy, you're 13, 14 years old and somebody comes on to you, you're going to experience a higher level of testosterone. And if you're one of these uh, ascended people, you, it's so easy to go way over to your female side because after gay sex, your estrogen levels are going to shoot up, your testosterone is going to go down, and then you crave sex again. So gay men can have sex five times in a night, sometimes 20 times in a night with different partners. They always need a different partner. They can't sustain the sexual attraction with their partner. Now, if you look at geniuses throughout time, geniuses were always kind of bisexual, had a crazy sex lives. I've got books on all the sex lives of various genius artists, writers, and politicians who are genius. All kinds of nefarious things going on because basically they would move back and forth from their male and female sides. They had access, but they couldn't create stability because they didn't have these techniques that we have mm -hmm. of monogamy and creating an attraction with the opposite polarity. Now, some, now, you know, once you've got a brain that's wired to be homosexual, you have no choice, right? So mm -hmm. that's why they say, gay people say they have no choice. Uh, you know, that's just how we're born. And it is for many of them. If you're a mother, and you're pregnant and you're being exposed to GMOs, toxicities mm -hmm. and plastics and whatever, we now know that affects the development of the boy brain to become more like a girl brain. Wow. Wow. And a girl becomes more like a male brain, more like wow. a tomboy brain. These are wow. all the effects of toxicity. So you're born with, I'm a man, but I'm born with the brain of a woman. I think I'm right. a woman basically, but my body has the hormone system of a man. So it's basically self-hatred and a right. conflict within yourself is massive, which then gets projected on the outer world doesn't accept me. Wow. It's no, I don't accept me, but I'm trying to accept me. Wow. And the only way out of it that I see, if you want to change, again, you can say there's no choice. This is where I am. Okay, that's your, that's your right. And there's nothing wrong with that, not to be ashamed of, but does it work? Are you happy and fulfilled? Mm. And if you're not happy and fulfilled, this imbalance of hormones within your body could be the reason why you're unbalanced. And you can, through brain plasticity training, mm -hmm. retrain your brain. Wow. Okay, but how would you do that? You'd have to stop doing the things that cause those grooves. And for mm. men, that would mean probably a couple of years of celibacy mm. uh, from having sex with men and the opportunity to start growing and the experience of having sex with women could start regrowing those hormones in the physical body, which would then regrow the loops in the brain, the pathways in the brain to develop its potential. It could develop a, a brain that goes along with your body hormone system. But right now there's so much despair and depression and anxiety. You know, one of my good friends, his, his daughter became a guy. And mm. you know, I said, how do you deal with that? He says, that's nothing, it's the depression, it's the bipolar, it's the wow. symptoms, it's the, wow. and then the wanting to take the hormones to try right. to find some kind of balance. You know, long before I understood all brain plasticity, I would never talk about this because you know, you're stuck with a woman's brain. If you're a guy, there's always gonna be that conflict inside. Right. But even if you have that conflict inside, what you can know is that well-being in your body happens with the right hormone balance for whether you've got a penis or a vagina. Mm. And if you got both, some people, a very small percent have both penis and vagina, then they have to be really good at having a life that supports both their male and their female side. So what I do in Beyond Mars and Venus is teach the actual behaviors that stimulate testosterone and the behaviors that stimulate estrogen and progesterone. And so we have to be responsible as human beings to know that our stress reactions only create the wrong pathways in our brain. That's called PTSD. Right. PTSD right. is a huge stress. Wow. You know, you just get one little memory of it and kabang, it comes back, you know? Um, and I've never had a big PTSD till my wife Bonnie died. Mm -hmm. Now I have tremendous more compassion for people with PTSD because you know, nothing's changed in my house. And, you know, Bonnie went down for nine months. I watched her body shrink, you know? Uh, she had a tumor in her digestive system and she couldn't eat food. Wow. So basically she starved to death. And that, that's just a horrible experience of powerlessness, trying to take care of and help and heal somebody who's just shrinking down. And so the trauma of that, I mean, 
it's for me. I mean, it's just simply, this is someone I dearly hold and feeling so powerless, right. uh, feeling so unworthy deep inside. I wish I could have fixed this. I couldn't do that. What could I, you know, how, and you know, these are just crazy emotions, but they're in there and you have to restructure the brain, which I've done now. The healing of it is now, anytime I see her, I just see her, you know, I have all the house, nothing's changed. Her clothes are there. The books are there. The pictures are there. Everything's the same. And I'm able to experience all these things that used to bring up pain with uh, the pain of powerlessness and guilt and shame and anger and sadness and dear despair, despair and fear, all that stuff came up. That's what healing process is. So each time I felt it back to the beginning of a conversation, I was able to go through the levels of anger, sadness, fear, and guilt, go through those feelings and always come back to what I wish, what I want. Cause see your desires come from your soul desire is the most beautiful thing when it's a positive desire it's all negative emotions are blocked desire they say i don't want that i don't want that i don't mm. want that to happen i shouldn't have done that i don't want you doing that and why didn't this happen it's always pushing back on desire but by feeling the emotions going deep into the emotions that's called grieving going through the whole process of all the emotions you come back to feeling your desire to love your need for love and your, your forgiveness of yourself, forgiveness of the other person, if there were issues there, you come back to understanding the truth emerges, you follow your heart, you get back to feeling good. And those are the waves of emotion that happen whenever there's a loss. You have to go through those emotions and many people don't, they just push it down mm -hmm. and they push down their life force. So we have to learn the mechanisms of healing ourselves and to recognize we all have these different traumas and once we have that trauma, every time we now seek to avoid that trauma or we seek or we engage ourselves in some behavior learned from that trauma, like ha ha hating someone, <laughs> you hurt me, so I hate you. Now, whenever I think of you, I hate you. If that happens, you're just making that groove more. You know, right. there was this thing where I learned if you're upset with somebody, they're always there in the grocery store. <laughs> there, there they are. They show up and get it again. And so now if you decide you're not going to go to the grocery store to avoid that person, you're actually making that groove stronger mm. of hating that person. Mm. So we have to learn how to utilize our negative emotions to balance our hormones, which will then create new pathways in mm. our brain. And we can create a harmony between our brain and our body and our spirit as a result. So this is like big stuff. This is like yeah. a, a picture of the possibilities and what monogamy does. Monogamy prevents you from having an easy exit from your emotions. Mm. See, so what I would describe is the ro three types of relationships, the role mate relationship, the soul mate relationship and the soul twin relationship. Now, I know people talk about twin flames. That's somebody else's story. But this is my experience. My experience is in the role mate relationship. That's my parents. They were happy. They didn't have great sex for a lifetime, but they were happy, fulfilled people because my dad had a good job. And my mother liked being a mother. That was it. Okay. So if, 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 you're, if you're in a role mate relationship, you're just together for the purpose of having a family and surviving and being secure. And they were, my dad was a, you know, a, they're both Stanford graduates. He had a good job. We live in a good neighborhood. Uh, my dad had, we had gentleman values. So my mother was always happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically I never saw them argue or fight. We had harmony in the family. I mean, amazing. I, that's why I became a therapist. Like, why are people having all these problems? I, I don't understand. Why would you be upset about these things? Because we were all so happy. All right. So that was the ideal role mate relationship. But they weren't having great sex. Okay. That wasn't the case. Now, we go over here to soulmate relationship is the potential for great sex mm. at the cost of all your buttons getting pushed. <laughs> you see, as Bonnie is my role mate, everything I've written in my books up to her death is lessons I learned finding love again when she would upset me. She'd push you my buttons. You mean your soulmate? Because a soulmate. A soulmate yeah. is a perfect person to push your buttons because their soul is a reflection of your soul. And what you resist in them is something within you, mm -hmm. okay, that you have mm -hmm. to look at and process. So it's like she was always into, you know, the house being neat. I'm a messy guy. Uh, ironically, now she's gone. I'm very, very neat. I... I <laughs> because of my growth through her, but I became more neat and she helped me and I helped her as well to relax around things being so having to be perfect or a certain way. 
I don't want it just to end without my explaining that one little, one little thing can change your life here. Mm. How did Bonnie get me to stop leaving the light on? Because she did. Mm. She just stopped being upset with me about it. Let it pass for a while. Then she came out one day and she said, she poked her head into the kitchen and she said, oh, John, I noticed the lights were on in the living room. And I know that you've been turning the lights out a lot and I appreciate that. But sometimes you still forget. So be nice if you could remember. And it's really no big deal. And then walked away. Three times, and from that day on, I would turn the light basically off when I went through because right. it was no big deal. Mm -hmm. It was not a manipulation. When you use negative emotions, you're saying, this is a big deal. I'm not going to fully be happy unless you change. It's like mm -hmm. uh, blackmail. Okay, <laughs> that, I haven't used that phrase before, but it's blackmail. Blackmail <laughs> is saying, you got to pay me, or I think it's blackmail, whatever, it's manipulation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, like which is unless you change, I won't love mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay, and unless you change, I won't love you. And that is not a relationship of the ascended order. So mm -hmm. if we want to have a soulmate relationship, what happens is everything inside of you that doesn't do that is going to have an opportunity to grow. So you're going to be upset with your partner and you're going to lose your attraction for your partner because you don't know how to process those feelings. You're going to push them down. And you're not going to have that aliveness that you used to feel because not your partner, because you pushed your feelings down. So that's right. A. And as soon as you stop feeling that, then you go, oh, I'll be polyamorous and I can go off with a new partner and I can get that stimulated. Or I can go off and be addicted to my drug and be happy and not get it from my partner. So all of these are the outlets, they're the leaks. It's the, all these places where your life force will leak out. But if you don't have those, then you're forced to suffer because you're suppressing yourself. And then if you have my technology, you process that and you're forced to come back to love because you're not right. going to get to go have sex with right. somebody else. You're not to be able to go out and be happy without your partner completely. You're mm -hmm. depending on them to make you happier if you're a woman. And I'm dependent on making her happier to find my highest self as well. So you have these easy outs. So you learn. Now, let me give you an example. It was like, I, I can't remember exact times, except I do know around 23 years in our marriage, we were married 32 years, 23 around that time, as um, I said to Bonnie, everything was getting very, very peaceful and the sex was better than ever. Okay. So this was like, you know, I thought, wow, this is an amazing milestone. No arguments, no fights, things. If something started push my button a little bit, I would just stop talking and I'd use the magic phrase, help me understand that better. Tell me more what else? And she would share her feelings and feel better. And I give her a big hug and I wouldn't solve her problems. I would just be understanding. See, this is, and she got to the point where she wasn't complaining to me all the time. She learned, you know, it doesn't work. Finally, it clicked in. That doesn't work. Let's find another way. And she found another way, which was simply to make a request as if it's a no big deal after first appreciating me. So, wow, who doesn't want to make a change then? All right. So, then in that, in that 23 years into the marriage, I said, honey, how do you rate me as a husband? Because I was feeling very confident myself. And she said, oh, you as a husband, as a father to our children, you're the best in the world. As a husband, you're not perfect, but <laughs> you've given me the greatest gift any woman could want. I said, what's mm -hmm. that? She says, I know I can upset you. My feelings can upset you. Sometimes what I do upsets you, how I react to things upsets you. And for 23 years, every time I do that, you stop talking, you go to your cave, you do some magic, and you always come out of the cave with more love. Not mm -hmm. I come out of the cave nice. No, I come out more love because I grow. Every upset is an opportunity to grow right. in wisdom. And with wisdom comes more love and more unconditional love. And she saw that. So if she upset, she knew, and she said, so I know that no matter what I say or do, you will never stop loving me and you will never leave me. Wow, that's right. safety. That's security. And that was a turning point for the last 10 years. Then what we had was great sex and almost all harmony. And I would call that a, a uh, not just a soulmate, but soul twins. And what that means is it felt like her twin and that everything she felt I could feel so easily mm. without any resistance. You see, if she's upset about something and I'm resisting it, 
it's because I'm not embracing that feeling within myself. I'm not understanding where she's coming from. Right. And, and that is so key, is where understanding is where we can get to, uh, where there's no right or wrong. It's just what works and what doesn't work. And then you finally figure out what works with your partner. And that reduces dramatically any resistance you ever have to them. And it reduces your resistance to the world. And the world then reflects not resisting you. And that's, that's the, real, the real secret of the secret. <laughs> right. It's, it's, you have to radiate this because you earned it by processing your feelings again and again and again. And so then you get that synchronicity, which you got synchronicity and end up at my ranch. And your great, great grandfather was got a street named after him there. Yeah. You know, synchronicities happen all the time when our hearts are open. And it's as though the world is here to, to, to support us in our growth. And, and we are in harmony because we're supporting the world and its growth. And the microcosm of that is your relationship. If you're not in an intimate sexual relationship, it's so easy to glide through life without your buttons getting pushed. And if your uh, buttons don't get pushed, then you don't know the darkness that's inside of you and you can't then heal the darkness inside of you. So it becomes the opportunity to find the perfect person you're sexually attracted to, you fall in love with, you feel right. safe with in the beginning. They're gonna push your buttons and then you're gonna take the time you need. And for men, it means taking your time to rebuild your testosterone and then reflect on how you could have solved that problem, handle yourself differently. For the woman, it's taking time to reflect on her emotions and feelings when she's not feeling loving. And she'll always, what will come up is blame, 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 blame. So that's the emotions. First look at the emotions, get in touch with what you want. And then imagine you're writing them out. You're not saying it to him, but it's as if you're saying it to him. So your monkey right. brain gets to feel like it's being heard. You're mm -hmm. hearing it. Then you write the response you'd want to hear from your partner. You don't, he doesn't have to do that. This is all made up in your own brain that you're not lovable. So you give the response that you would want to hear. And then you imagine, wow, how would I feel if I had that? And then notice exactly. how you feel, and that's the real you. Yeah. Now, now reflect on the last interaction and what you did wrong in that. Just as a man, once he rebuilds his testosterone, he looks at the interaction and realizes what he did wrong in that. Now, along with seeing what you do wrong, you can always look at what your partner does wrong. Just don't tell them. Exactly. Nobody wants to be told they're wrong. Okay, get that. We just have to get that. And typically it's women who don't want men to say your feelings are wrong and men don't want women saying your behavior is wrong. And ironically, if you tell a man what he should do, you're not telling him his behavior is wrong, but say you should do this. You actually imply that his behavior is wrong. So giving unsolicited advice and men are from Mars is a whole chapter, one of the big mistakes women make because it's, it's a way of smiling while inside you're dissatisfied. It's couched in, oh, I just wanna help you. And you think you are helping, but unless he's asking for the help, you're actually punching him in the stomach. You're lowering his testosterone. So now we have all this knowledge of how you can keep passion alive. Who wants that? Why not be in a monogamous relationship? Because in a monogamous relationship where a woman feels you'll never leave her, then she can truly depend on you as her primary source of love and support to take her higher, higher than she can do on her own. But she has to feel uh, that you're not gonna pull away. And yeah, we men, we get close, pull away, but we always come back. And that's the whole key is bouncing back and forth and understanding the rubber band theory that happens in my book. So that's a really interesting <laughs> conversation we had. For sure. I, and I, I, I know no, no time is running out and uh, you probably have to go. Uh, there's a, there's a one more question I would have that would kind of maybe tie it back to this monogamy idea that I have not heard you answer myself, which is this idea, like this kind of alchemical idea that, uh, can, what do you think about this idea of like when you are having sex with someone you love and you have an orgasm or ejaculation and you then make your intention, let's say your intention to bring forth uh, a baby in love or something like that you use it as a, this kind of method and the, one of the reasons i'm also saying is and tying it to this other idea which is kind of this crazy increased use of technology and i know you are a biohacker and i i like to think of myself as a biohacker and i like to use technology we both do of course but like even in finnish finland biology books for ninth grader there's this chapter about human 2.0 that list three faults of woman, uh, three faults of me, uh, human. One being like 
that uh, our, our brain could use some implant to have a, have a plant to, to be connected directly to the cloud and we could have a GPS plant in our brain to connect to the cloud so we never get lost. And the third fault it listed as a fault for human is that pregnancy takes a long time. It's inefficient. And a better solution it offered would be that, how about having just uh, efficiently babies born in a capsule? So what do, you, what do you think about this kind of increasing use of technology? And I know it's a big topic, but tying it back to this kind of idea that also, what do you think about like using this sex okay, and love? It's, it's, uh, it's, tran it's called transhumanism. Exactly, yeah. And we as human beings are something very unique and that we have the capacity to consciously change our brains. And if we depend on someone else to do it, we lose that ability. Mm. The whole objective is to create kind of a hive mentality where centralized control controls all of us. And to a great extent, that's all part of the agenda of some people to create this hive mentality where women are in the workplace, men are in the workplace, so children are separated from their parents and then they get indoctrinated with transhumanist ideas uh, and it all looks very very wonderful and yet it's not it's very very awful what's happening now just there's a wonderful social uh another uh, documentary called social dilemma on netflix yes, yes. just uh talking about the danger of facebook and the whole social thing how it's mm -hmm. causing depression how it's causing inability to have relationships and we see it happening all the time. Uh, you know, our brain is wired to experience fulfillment through personal relationship. And all it takes is hyperstimulation of dopamine through technology. We lose that ability to experience the fulfillment of connecting with another human being. And we, we are at a precipice of an amazing uh, time of being sourcing our lives. And there are forces that do not want you to source your life. They want you to be a hive mentality where everybody exists in a homogene homogeneous harmony together and no creativity except complete control. Mm -hmm. And whether you believe in these things or not, it's kind of like you can just say, this is happening. I happen to feel there's forces in the universe. They're always the forces of light and dark. I am the force of light. There are the forces of darkness that are trying to make everyone the same. It's only in our uniqueness that we are the pieces that can come together to form a whole, as opposed to losing that power of creativity, losing the power of passion, the power of great sex. I've been to the transhumanist conferences and I, I love standing up and saying, this is a pretty hard sell guys, you're gonna give up sex, <laughs> but you certainly look like you already have. <laughs> There's no life force in it at all. <laughs> You know, we're not robots. You don't want to be a robot. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not into any kind of genetic mutilization of our food. The GMOs, if we look at what GMOs have done is they have also contributed. If you have the GMO, genetically modified organisms in our food, they bind with receptor sites in the body and they cause a baby in the womb of a mother who's eating GMOs. The baby will be a boy with a female brain and it'll be a girl mm -hmm. with a male brain. And this will only create self-hatred, which gives rise to overreactivity, taking things personally. What do we see in the universities? Everybody is so offended by everything. You know, my ideas, for example, I can't even go on a university and give a talk because the insurance costs would be so great because the students demonstrate. Wow. I used to teach at Stanford University until all of the feminist girls started creating chaos and demonstrating and creating danger and throwing things. And, then, and the feminist guys along with them who support them. Uh, so I can't even speak at universities anymore. I'm considered dangerous. Okay, these are ideas. These are ideas. You can choose wow. to believe them or not. But this is, and now what's happening on YouTube and Facebook and places, various types of people who don't speak the, the what is it called? The basic message that's given on TV. Mainstream if you are agenda. an outlier in any way, they're now censoring it. This is like horrible what's happening, censorship, domination, control, the idea of injecting every single person on the planet with something, such a massive dependence externally, rather than having to face the consequences of not taking right action yourself.
Mm. I don't, I do hack my brain with technologies that don't interfere with my processes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is super pure water, oxygenated water, mm -hmm. uh, good supplements. Uh, ironically now I don't take hardly any supplements. I basically, I meditate, I have great sex and I don't <laughs> overeat and I'm, I work out in a gym and I exercise and I love nature. You know, that's really who we are as human beings. And that's when I've been my most loving self. Mm -hmm. And what I see happening in transhumanists is no love, function without love. Mm -hmm. And that's putting in all these things and uploading and all of that. We should not do it. It's not right to do it or it doesn't work to do it if you want to have a loving world. You want to have people who don't feel connected, but just follow orders. That's what some people want. They also don't want so many people on the planet. <laughs> so all it takes, all it oh. takes is certain injections that people are all mandatory have to take. And then you just slip in there a little uh, extra ingredient that keeps women from having babies. And that's why they were actually outlawed in certain places in South Africa as they found that the Gates injections uh, actually had, uh, uh, I forget the chemical in it, the hormone in it that keeps women from being have babies. And it was one out of nine. So they pace it. It, about, it started out as one out of nine, then one out of eight, one oh. out of seven, one out of six. And then you basically, uh, it'll be like the handmaid's tale. Women won't be able to make babies and you have complete control. They'll be manufactured. They'll be, they'll be uh, educated according to the agenda as opposed to wow. you know, our own individual expression and finding our own self-autonomy rather than over-dependence externally. And that's what we need to look for is how to find mm -hmm. that. I think teaching meditation, uh, doing meditation, uh, doing practices that increase health and vitality and hormonal imbalance. I'll say something for meditation. You know, since Bonnie died, one of the, one of the good things that's happened is <laughs> that I have more time uh, to be alone and I meditate more. And I think it's just amazing what meditation can do for you, particularly while we have all this COVID stuff going on. Uh, I'm not out there facing the world all the time when I'm traveling and teaching and doing that. That all produces testosterone, solving problems, overcoming challenges, fixing things, getting places, you know, handling you know, just getting on an airplane, you got to go through security, you got to wait in a line, you got to run to your gate, you got to make sure you get on the right flight, you got to change. Mm -hmm. See, these are all problems. When men are faced with problems and they're capable, they feel confident, I know how to solve these problems, it makes testosterone. Sitting home watching Netflix makes very, very little. Mm. It will make a little if you've been working all day long, then a little passivity will rebuild your testosterone, but you've got to use it up before your body will rebuild it through passivity. And passivity is really depending. Mm. So if you work hard, then it's fine to depend on someone to balance it. So if men work hard, the ultimate depending on someone is have great sex with your partner. So having great sex every day is now what I get to do uh, in, in my life because I have, I've mastered the ejaculation control thing. Because mm -hmm. then you got, <laughs> you got the juice, it never yeah. goes away. And, but you've got to balance that. That's passivity, okay? That's mm -hmm. going to your female side, all that love and all that passion. You got to have the problems to overcome if you're a man. And, you know, men are become weak, weak. And when I make these generalizations, I'm not saying all men are this way. You're not that way. I see you as a superman out there doing your thing and committed to relationship, trying to help the world, working hard. That is your male side balanced with your female side because you're loving a woman. You're trying to find out solutions to find it. But how many people are you? You know, mm. we are the minority. What we see is out there, people want to be polyamorous or men who don't want to make a commitment. So let me talk about those men. Men feel that, oh, I, I don't want to give up my freedom. Mm -hmm. Your freedom to waste your energy. Is it free to mm. lust after a woman who doesn't want you? How many women out there do you lust after that don't want you? You're being rejected all the time, whether you know it or not. Or you see some girl and you're attracted to her and you don't go up to her because you're too shy or insecure. You're just rejected yourself again. That's another blow yeah. to your testosterone levels. Or simply, it's someone who's not available to you, out of your league. You know you're not going to get her or you don't even want her, but you want that body. You want to have sex with her. Mm -hmm. To want what you can't have is going to destroy you. Mm -hmm. It weakens you. It makes you a loser. So the opposite of that is to want what you do have. Yes. You see the difference? See, that's yes. the book, yes. how to get what you want and want it. <laughs> yes, <you know>? yes. <laughs> People thought they get it and they can't want it. That's the, <laughs> having desire for what you have. So this is like, 
That's what monogamy is if you yeah. have great sex. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, having said all that, is this for everybody? No, this is for mm -hmm. the people who are ascended. I don't know how many people are ascended. They don't have the, the other people don't have the possibility for this and they could be happy. My parents were happy. If you want to have, I've got friends. I just had dinner with two people. The guy had been in a marriage, no sex at all. The wife wants a divorce, but it's too big, big of a hassle. So they live together as friends, family. Right. And it's just, you know, I'm happy the way, good, that's your life, that's what you want. If you feel dissatisfaction, then you're motivated to listen to what I say. But if you're happy with what you got, I, I have no problem with that. And he asked me, he says, you know, am I doing it wrong? I said, no, no, you do what you want to do. I'm your friend. Exactly. If you came to me as your teacher and I wasn't just your friend and you said you had a big problem and you want my advice, okay, you want to have passion? This is how you do it. You, yep. you get your balls, you leave that house, you start your life over. It's a big hassle, but this is the outcome you'll get. Otherwise, you can have passivity in your life. That's okay. And the woman across, she'd been with several, married a couple of times. She's a very successful businesswoman, made lots of money remodeling her house. Totally lonely inside, but okay with that. I'm okay with that. Hmm. And I'm over there talking about great sex every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, well, is there something wrong with what I did? No, that's something wrong with it. If that works for you, that works for you. But there okay. is an option. And the option is learning something new and realizing Men are not the problem if you're a woman and men knowing that you're the problem if you're not having great sex. And there's solutions to this if you're motivated to do it. If you're not, hey, have a life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can't, I mean, for me too, I was for a long time single doing a lot of projects and uh, it's, it's, it's been so motivating. I mean, so inspiring to find somebody who I can just bring and put everything onto the relationship also to, with the idea to try to grow, try to go over, overcome challenges and to grow in love and, uh, and she's just incredible. I mean, the reason I can do this podcast is because she took care of the dance school that we have together. To, uh, she's a dancer also for me to be able to even do this podcast because she believes in my, my, my vision and my mission and she wants to support and be there. And I couldn't be more grateful for her. You know I mean, it's just amazing. And, and, and let's just put that in context. So the key, when the woman is making more money than the guy, so it's important that she sees you working hard. That's very important. Mm -hmm. She can't come home seeing you masturbating <laughs> to do. <Zoom. laughs> okay? sure. That doesn't work. Uh, she can't have you watching too much TV being passive. She needs yeah. to feel that you're working hard. That's for one sure. thing. And ironically, this is how many women are different. I'm the major money pri provider. If my wife didn't work hard, I would care less. If she's mm -hmm. happy, that's all I care about, then I can make her happier. But women want to see that you're working hard too, even if you're not making the more money. The next thing there is to realize when a woman feels the pressure to make the money, money is a huge testosterone producer, okay? So she feels that pressure. It's going to lower estrogen. That's where your relationship skills become really, really good. Not only yeah. do you have to show her that you're working hard, but yep. two is you have to make sure she learns how to open up her emotions and her feelings. Yep. Yep. And of course, that if she feels safe to reveal herself. Now, the key to this is long before you can have the great physical intimacy, there has to be an emotional intimacy, which makes it safe for her emotions to come forth. Then there has to be an intellectual intimacy. Mm -hmm. The intellectual intimacy is where you never correct her thinking, but you may not agree with it. But you can even go, well, I have a different thought. I would think this and this and this. Help me understand your thinking more. Well, I can see your point. We may not agree on it, but I think it's, you know, what you're saying makes sense. You see, that is where we, we argue because we, we tend to want to be right, mm, as opposed to sure. seeing the other person from their perspective yep. that they're right. And yep. that intellectual intimacy is very, very important for women. Otherwise, after a while, they won't have any physical chemistry. And of course, the emotional safety, which is to reveal what's inside. And of course, I know you can do that because you've had training from me, which is how to create a space, but she hasn't. So mm. she really needs to be open. You know, it takes two to really make a relationship go. Yep. And women need to recognize how to process their emotions and use their man to process their emotions. And as a man, you have to be careful not to use her to process your emotions. Yep. You know, yep. it says if she wants to get That's you to talk, you can share, oh, I had this mm -hmm. experience with this and I saw this, I went here, stay on the surface with it. Yep. That at least creates a space for her to feel, okay, now I can talk too. 
but don't go deep into your feelings. If you have yep. negative emotions going on, it's none of her business. Yep. Uh, you know, if you just keep it to yourself and you process it and you know how to process it. Uh, but what happens is processing your emotions can be an addiction if you're using them to change somebody. Okay. Mm. If you're yep. Expressing your emotions out loud to mm -hmm. someone, wanting them to sort of change because they've heard it. That mm -hmm. just, that just reinforces pathways in the brain that uh, produce negative reactions. And you know, my daughter, Lauren, you know, yep. Lauren has been working on brain plasticity and she used to be gluten intolerant and now she's mm. not. Wow. Uh, that was just the fear of gluten actually creates that, that pathway right. more and more. So she consciously learned how to change that. Oh. She also, because of that, uh, and the tendency that created that anyway was uh, her metabolism was thrown off due to some kind of thyroid. So many women today take mm. thyroid medicine. Yep. Uh, and with using by changing brain plasticity to maintain lower stress levels, she no longer takes thyroid medicine at all either. So this is like amazing, you know. She she has biohacked herself. She grew up with a father who knows everything about supplements. MarsVenus.com has all yep. the supplements in the world if you're out of balance. Yep. But she found balance and doesn't need any supplements. Has perfect health, <laughs> no addictions, great great marriage and great intimacy. Like. You know, people always say, they used to say to, to Lauren, oh, she'll never find a man like you, like her father, you know, mm. she'll, she found somebody better than me. He puts me to shame. He's like an amazing husband for her, a partner for her. They're, they're just so happy. I've never seen a happier couple in my life, basically, because she had a role model of a father who knew how to make it work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's the opposite of what people think. They think if you're a good father, your daughter will never find somebody. Actually, if you're mm. a good father, her self-esteem will be such that she'll sure. find the right person for her and she'll attract the right person for her. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, luckily, my uh, my, my fiance, she actually likes your books and she's been doing some of the processes on her own. Or she's just a super wise woman who knew that I like you and she liked the books because of she knew that I liked them. I don't know. But oh. uh, either way, it's, 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 it's beautiful. And I have two caves, uh, like one float tank and a one cold cottage that I go to if I like. Uh, That's so like, important to have our cave. Yeah. But also what you have that most men could really learn from. And if I ever see you again, you should give me a lesson. But how to do dance. Dance, <laughs> when you're leading her in dance, as long as she's not correcting you. <laughs> no, she's not. Yeah, she's not. If she doesn't correct you, that's one of the biggest testosterone stimulators for men and estrogen stimulators exactly. for women is to feel a man can lead her where mm -hmm. she wants to go. Beautiful. She is safe and yet he leads her and you are like <laughs> the master of that. And that's where we have to be in relationships as well is to be able to lead where she needs to go. Wow. Well, I think that's a beautiful ending. Thank you so much for your wisdom, John. It's always a pleasure to hear from you and your ideas and your wisdom. And thank you for sharing it to the world. And uh, I, I wish you also all the best and your, your girlfriend, Lauren, say hi and your family. Uh, nothing but blessings and love. Oh, and one, one thing I want to just do a little yeah. promotion for Lauren. For many people, sure. when women are too dependent, when women are unhappy in a marriage, in a relationship, or because you're single now and you were in a relationship and it didn't work, okay? That's usually the case. It's the reason for that, if we can sum up all of our relationship problems, is you were depending on him for too much, mm. okay? You, you didn't have the foundation of finding your happiness where he can now take you happier. Mm. So that's the key. And Lauren has created this course with me. It's called How to Get Me Time. And How to Get Me Time is a six-week course you take with exercises. We do the processes for you. It's a whole wonderful thing. People love it. We get rave reviews. And what it's about is learning as a woman how, when I'm not happy, how to find my happiness in my me time without depending on him. Right. So that then from a happier place, a centered place, I know how to ask for help, how to get support, how to set boundaries in a way that works in my life so I'm not overwhelmed. And learning how to get me time is the, is the course that takes you step by step into that. Uh, actually more practical than Men Are From Mars book simply because we're giving you exercises and processes and step by step. So that, that you can find that at marsvenus.com. How to get me time with Lauren Gray. And I would, uh, one more plug for you is to, of course, to make sure to check your uh, Thursday Facebook Live that you have on the Pacific time. I think it's eight. So I think Helsinki, it's at 10 o'clock in the morning, if I understood correctly. Uh, but it, I will put, 
it's it's 10, 10 o'clock in the morning pacific time california time 10 ah right so it's yeah it's eight o'clock in the, yeah in in so i will i will uh put those links of course also to the show notes and and, and, all and your everybody books. can know i have also an online course that's free and it's a structured course structured courses get to the point you know it doesn't mm -hmm. go down rabbit holes you know talking to me listening to my talks is more like getting a wide range of knowledge as a background <laughs> But the courses actually focus you on what you can actually do today and tomorrow and so forth. And uh, we do have a free course right at marsvenus.com, marsvenus.com called How to Get Everything You Want, How to Get Everything You Want in Your Relationship, something like that, right on the front page. And over a four day period, you'll get all these interactions with us to help you with the best points. And we're getting rave reviews on that. So mm -hmm. actually more rave reviews on that and on Lauren's course. And, nice. and, you know, my Facebook live is, it's no, it's, ama <laughs> it's amazing. And it, uh, for sure, I will, uh, I will put all those links, links for people to go check it out. I will uh, definitely recommend and uh, of course, uh, keep up the amazing work. What's, uh, is there anything next? And maybe we have one day you coming to Finland, who knows? Well, not right now, not right now. I can't <laughs> go anywhere. <laughs> one day, one day, let's see. <laughs> one day, uh, one day, I would love to come. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank Nico, you, Nico. Uh, people yeah. should know that you are a, a star and a genius, and in the realm of relationship, they're lucky to have you as someone who can help guide them and inspire them. Uh, I appreciate you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, great to hear that from you. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I will also keep on doing. I just started uh, from a dating academy first, and now I'm of course expanding that into all kind of relationship advice and ideas and uh, giving some personal coaching to people and men and women and it's been it's been so rewarding especially with with my own fiance and relationship it's just even so much more rewarding because i'm putting all of these ideas into use in my own personal relationship so it's 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 really the perfect well, you know you just open up another can of worms and i'll just mention <laughs> it if people go to marsvenuscoaching.com mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a one-year coaching training program. Right. You taking all my classes, you got the same thing. But basically, if you really want great relationships, you can become a coach because it's so mm. much easier to be an example of what you want to be when you're teaching other people to be it. <laughs> I'd say my insurance policy of having a great marriage was constantly teaching these ideas and it makes me remember what works and, what, exactly. and noticing what doesn't work. Yep. So if you're helping other people as kind of a part-time job or full-time job, whatever, uh, it can make a big difference for your own life and your own quality relationships. So that's the marsvenuscoaching.com. You could find that there. People are interested in learning about that program. For sure. Well, John, I know we went over time. But thank, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And thank you for sharing all of this. And uh, yes, let's just keep in touch. And maybe one day you'll be in Finland. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and share this episode with your friends. See you again on the next Mikko Kempe podcast episode.